Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're going to be talking about growth mindset in math. I'm Karen Lewis, and I'm joined by my colleagues Lauren Bates. Hello. And Shannon Davidson. Hi, everyone. We're going to take some turns here. I'm going to start us off by orienting us to the materials and then walking us through the research. And then Shannon and Lauren are going to walk us through some of the slides on implementing classroom practices and interventions to promote growth mindset. Earlier this week, I shared with you a folder worth of materials, and these would be all the materials that would relate to this session on growth mindset in particular. Let me bring those up. And in that packet of materials, there are several things. A facilitator guide that accompanies a PowerPoint show. So today I'm going to walk you through this PowerPoint show, and I'm going to be using the facilitator guide we put together um, to make this presentation. And this facilitator guide is, is, you can think of it as an annotated kind of handout for walking through the presentation so that you have everything you need to go ahead and take these materials and implement the training tomorrow if you'd like. But I want you to know that we, we didn't intend for the facilitator guide to work as kind of a script for you. We very much trust that you will use your professional judgment and tweak these materials in ways that make them work as, as best as possible for your specific context. So um, it very much is something that you could mix around and cut out sections if you feel like the group you're talking to is more knowledgeable about growth mindset, you could maybe cut back on the research. But the facilitator guide um, serves as a nice document to walk you through and be able to talk about all the slides. I'm going to bring that up to show you just real quick. You should have um, this in your email. If you did not, I'm happy to send it along again. Um, and all of these materials will be on our, our partnership website. But here's what the facilitator guide work looks like. It gives you a sense of how long this would take, some background readings, and then all of the materials you would need at the outset to get you prepped to deliver this training yourself. It includes um, an agenda to get you a sense of how long each of the various sections would take and then launches in on the third page with information for each um, section within the slide deck about how to talk about it and some tips and facilitator notes to, to support you and what you need to know to deliver the training. So like I said today, I'm going to go through this training, um, go through the slides to cover the background on the research on growth mindset, and then the kinds of strategies that we um, found in our combing of the literature. Um, and I'm delivering this training as I would to a group of teachers that are more novice in this area with the understanding that um, you as trainers and teacher leaders, instructional coaches, probably have a really deep um, knowledge of growth mindset to begin with. Um, and I, I trust that you will be able to know your audience better than I would and, and tweak this if need be. So when I present this material, if it's a little bit more basic than your current knowledge, I don't mean in any way to insult your expertise in this area. I just wanted, we, the training we wanted to put together was kind of um, starting with the most basic audience that would have less knowledge of the topic and be able to work from there. All right, so we have an hour together today. This training is scheduled to last about two hours altogether. Um, so clearly we're not going to be able to walk through all aspects of the training in today's webinar, but I want to speak about each of the different activities that we have planned to give you a sense of why we selected them and, and how we picture them fitting into the overall training itself. So for this, um, this training on growth mindset, we wanted to start with an icebreaker to get people um, uh, warmed up thinking about growth mindset in maybe ways that are unexpected and working with the group if you were to be working with a group of teachers. And one way we thought would be nice to do this is to break the ice by getting people to play with some origami puzzles. <clears throat> if you're not aware or familiar with these, they're really fun. <clears throat> and in the set of materials we've given you, we have a handout here. It's one of the, um, the PowerPoint or the PDFs has some examples of these puzzles that you can cut out and provide to teachers. And the goal here is to take a sheet of paper <clears throat> and fold it in such a way that one side has all black squares and the opposite side has all white squares. And the puzzles differ in levels of um, challenge. Some are, some are really easy and able to solve right away. Some are much harder. And so our idea with this icebreaker would be that you would give people some time to try them and encourage them to work through um, more and more challenging puzzles. And then after they've had a chance to complete some work together with a partner um, to reflect on that experience. And we would um, have people discuss with their partner these kinds of questions and get them to think about and talk about what was your initial reaction to the puzzles? Um, did you feel confident you could get better with the puzzles as you worked on them and they got more challenging? Uh, what kind of internal self-talk did you have as you worked on the puzzles? 
And we like this as a way to get people kind of thinking about and reflecting on some ideas they might have about themselves and their abilities, especially in unexpected domains like working on puzzles, because often we find when the puzzles get more challenging, you get people that experience frustration and, and get frustrated and say things like, oh, I'm just not a puzzles person. Um, and we might be able to bring um, a little bit more self-reflection to the table about unexpected ways in which mindsets can um, influence how we react in the world. And it's also just really fun. <laughs> so this would be a nice way to get things kicked off. And then learning, uh, moving into the learning objectives to set the stage for what we hope people take away from this training. And those learning objectives include, first and foremost, what's really critical here, I think, is reflecting on their own mindsets about math and being able to do some, some deep, 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 deep digging and think about how people um, feel about their own math abilities. The other objectives include considering how fixed versus growth mindsets impact students' learning and engagement in math. And finally, learning and being able to get a chance to practice some strategies to promote growth mindset in the math classroom. So to start and meet that first objective of really getting people familiar with the concept of what, what mindsets are and how they impact learning and outcomes, we want to make sure we start by defining what mindsets are. And this figure is a really nice um, condensed summary of what mindsets are and how they are linked to different outcomes. And as you know, this research was pioneered by Dr. Carol Dweck, who is a developmental psychologist. So really her, her goal in, in this research at the beginning was to figure out how people respond to and um, cope with failure. Because in some of her early research she had um, discovered that some people tend to cope with failure with rather kind of a, a kind of crumbling response and just falling apart, whereas others seem to cope with it better and embrace failure as a necessary part of the learning process. And from her research, she categorizes people into one of two mindsets, a fixed mindset versus a growth mindset. And people with a fixed mindset tend to view their intelligence or their abilities as really fixed qualities, that they're more of a gift or some innate capacity from birth that really can't be changed significantly, versus a growth mindset where people think and feel about their intelligence and abilities as things that can be developed over time with effort and strategies and hard work. Um, we're going to explore more about how mindsets impact learning and outcomes, but I like this figure and we've included it in the materials we shared with you because it really nicely summarizes how we know growth mindset um, operates. And, and what we see here in this figure is that it, it really downstream impacts how people cope with and respond when they encounter challenges and obstacles. Um, and on the positive side, when people have more of a growth mindset, we see that they really are more likely to persist when they meet obstacles and embrace challenges as part of the learning process, as opposed to avoiding challenges and giving up in the face of obstacles. Now, what's important to keep in mind about mindsets is we often talk about it as fixed versus growth, uh, as if people are just one or the other um, globally. But what we, what we know is that people can have different mindsets for various topics. So it's possible to very much embrace a growth mindset when it comes to learning languages, whereas you can hold more of a uh, different kind of mindset in other domains. So it's important to consider that and help people reflect on the pockets of themselves and their self-beliefs that might um, be more in line with one end of the spectrum of growth versus a fixed mindset. Now we think that mindsets are incredibly important to consider when it comes to math in particular, and that's why we're all here today to think about students' math attitudes and how we can support them. And we wanted to start with talking about growth mindsets when it comes to math because there are some unique features of math as a domain that um, might set students up to be more likely to endorse those kinds of fixed mindsets. Now, as people that work with students and teachers, you know and have seen in your work that students develop math skills incrementally over many years. Um, however, we tend to have this really persistent stereotype that math ability isn't something that develops incrementally, but rather it's innate, that some people are just born that way, they're just math geniuses from birth. Um, and this is a rather persistent stereotype that we can't seem to shake. 
And uh, this, I think, is part of why we often hear people say things like, oh, I'm just not a math person, or I'm terrible at math, um, whereas we don't hear that in other domains. You rarely hear people say, I'm just, I'm just terrible at letters. I'm just not a reading person. Um, it seems to me math in particular is a domain where people are much more likely to embrace this kind of idea that math is a gift. You either have it or you don't. And people are more comfortable with saying that it's something that they don't have. At this point, if I was um, working with a group of teachers, I would pause here for some important self-reflection and have people think about whether, in their experience, they've ever heard anyone say, I'm not a math person, or this kind of endorsing this idea that math is something that's gifted, and think about whether they've heard other people say it or whether they might even have heard, have said it themselves. Um, because I said at the outset, we want to build self-reflection into this training as much as we can. So it's important to keep in mind that when we hear or when we um, send out those messages about people being um, a math person or not, we really are getting at the heart here of what mindset is, of whether it's something that you're born with or something that can grow over time. And I want to start um, at, or introduce our discussion of how mindsets are important for outcomes by um, drawing back to the work of Camille Farrington and her colleagues at the University of Chicago Consortium. And she is an influential researcher in the field of non-cognitive factors more broadly. And she's been interested in, in what it is, the non-cognitive factors that help students to do well in school and life. And in her work, she's used this term of academic mindset as kind of a catch-all term for the ways um, young people think about themselves as learners and the kinds of attitudes and beliefs they have. And she has done a really thorough review of the research in this area to kind of form a really what I think is useful model for showing us how academic mindsets linked, are linked to academic outcomes. And what her research has shown is pretty convincing evidence that academic mindsets um, eventually downstream promote academic outcomes, but it's more because in the interim they really support the kinds of academic behaviors we know are really important for school success. So these academic behaviors are things like studying hard, attending class, working hard on homework, persevering in the face of challenges. And it's those kinds of behaviors that are what seem to have the ultimate um, impact on showing higher test scores. And the mindsets that she has distilled as being really critical for academic outcomes are the four you see listed here. Um, the first is I belong in this community. The second is I can succeed at this. The third is my ability and my competence grow with effort and fourth, this work has value for me. And number three probably stands out to you because that's why we're all here today. And of course, this is what growth mindset is, the belief that ability and competence really can grow and improve for everyone um, with effort and hard work. So if we look and turn to the research on growth mindset and math in particular, there's a really strong and robust body of evidence linking mindsets to math success. We know from several studies that students that endorse a growth mindset have better math grades and test scores relative to their peers that endorse more of a fixed mindset. We also see really interesting research um, showing and supporting this idea that mindsets um, help us transition more successfully in the face of challenges. So Dweck and her colleagues have um, a great study that, that tracks students from the elementary to middle school transition. And this is a time that we know um, many students for the first time are actually encountering challenges and finding math to be more difficult than it had been in the past. And I think this is another thing, uh, a point to consider about what makes math unique is that math, unlike um, other domains like the language arts, often when a student encounters a new math concept, it can be completely new in every aspect. And so encountering a challenge there, there's not often that same safe space of um, past successes that can make those challenges seem even more threatening. But in, in this research, we saw that students that endorsed a growth mindset seemed to transition more successfully across that more challenging jump from elementary to junior high school math. And in part, we explain that by this um, capacity to cope more successfully and embrace challenges as opposed to finding them threatening. 
Um, as another uh, point of evidence of the importance for mindsets and outcomes in math in particular, there's a really um, interesting study um, that came out recently that was done with virtually almost all 10th grade students in Chile, and they found that students' mindsets predicted their language as well as their mathematics achievement. Even more interesting nuance in this study was that <clears throat> we see that uh, the low-income low students in this sample did have lower test scores overall, as we would expect and as we see quite frequently in our own um, United States data. But what we saw here is that low-income students who endorsed growth mindsets were performing um, on par with their peers that had higher incomes. So there seems to be some um, protective benefits from endorsing these mindsets for students that are traditionally um, marginalized and underserved. So the evidence is really robust that mindsets are important for math outcomes, which of course begs the question, why? How is it that mindsets seem to impact math achievement? And we have a, um, a good picture of how that seems to be, because we know that um, students with a growth mindset tend to behave differently in the classroom. As we mentioned earlier, their academic behaviors um, are different from their peers who endorse fixed mindsets. So students with a growth mindset are more likely to um, believe that their effort pays off, that it's worthwhile to put in hard work, they'll improve. They're also more likely to set learning goals for themselves. So a learning goal is um, when students prioritize um, the ways they can learn and improve their skills as opposed to setting what are called performance goals. Um, and there, students' goals aren't so much about learning new skills and improving, but rather about proving themselves and being able to perform um, and impress. And finally, students with growth mindsets also seem to endorse this belief that effort-based strategies, trying hard, trying newer and different um, techniques, will help them overcome their failures. On the, on the opposite end of the spectrum, we know that students with a growth mindset are less likely, when they do encounter failure, to attribute it um, to things they can't control. So less likely to endorse a statement like, this test was unfair, that's why I failed. So put that package all together about the things students with growth mindsets are more or less likely to do, we're seeing um, a pretty clear picture emerging here that students with growth mindsets are willing to put in that effort even when they encounter a challenge, when they're struggling or failing, and they stay focused on what they can learn, which over time results in better math performance. Now there's some really interesting evidence that um, uh, shows us and gives us a picture about what, what fixed versus growth mindsets is doing um, in students' inner experiences when we look at um, ERP studies that use EEG equipment to look at electrical activity in the brain. And we see that students with a fixed mindset actually have a pattern of brain activity suggesting that they have a stronger reaction to negative feedback. So in this study, students were given a quiz, and they could get answers right or wrong. And after they completed the quiz, um, they were given feedback on each individual item. And it seemed that students that had the fixed mindset um, found that event of having a negative um, answer uh, was more threatening to them. But they also spent less time paying attention to the kind of feedback that would help them learn and correct their answers in the future. Um, which uh, the end result was they actually did learn less. They were given a surprise retest, and students with a fixed mindset learn less on this um, math uh, quiz overall. And why these results are really important is because what they're telling us here is they're painting this picture that students' beliefs about intelligence um, not only influence kind of their reaction to failure, but they actually influence their learning because they're changing how students focus their attention in learning situations and the kind of effort they go to to remember new material. And I think it's important at this point <clears throat> when you're working with a group of teachers to track back and um, help encourage people to think about their own mindsets. We've just painted a, a picture of showing how mindsets affect learning and how they affect outcomes. And so we want, uh, we would give a break here in the training to um, stop talking at people, and instead have them do a little bit of reflection. So here's some example questions I might use in a training, um, something like, uh, what's an area or topic you know you hold a growth mindset? So start on the positive side. And if you know you hold a growth mindset, how is it you know? What kind of information about yourself makes you think that? And then after giving people some time to reflect about the, 
places they might have a growth mindset on the opposite end of the spectrum, I would ask people to think about um, whether they might have a fixed mindset in the aspects of their lives by having them think about something they don't like to do and think, consider whether they may or may not have a fixed mindset about their abilities here. Um, from personal experience, I think the more I learn about growth mindset, and I um, have been I have a PhD in social psychology, I've been thinking about these topics for many years, but I still surprise myself by finding little pockets of my own personality where I do tend to hold a fixed mindset, and it's, I find it surprising, and so I think it's worth uh, encouraging people to reflect on this and, and being real with the teachers you're working with and kind of revealing that about yourself. Um, I think it helps start the conversation and get people to, to really dig in and engage there in their self-reflection. So after that kind of conversation, I think it's important to do that at this point in the training because the next place we turn is to understanding how teachers' mindsets influence that, those of students. Um, and, and the theme that you'll see that we've woven throughout all the trainings in this series is the importance of adults' attitudes and how they impact students. So in the growth mindset training, we talk here about the two ways that teachers' mindsets can influence students. And a body of research shows us that we know teacher mindsets can both impact the kinds of pedagogical decisions they make in the classroom, as well as the type of feedback that they tend to give to students. And so we walk through the research here on these two aspects. So first of all, we know that teachers' mindsets can influence their pedagogical decisions. Um, and teachers, in particular with a fixed mindset, who themselves might find um, failure and challenging more upsetting, tend to change their pedagogy from um, one of challenging students and encouraging growth to instead comforting students. So this can take the shape, for instance, of assigning less math homework to a student that's struggling, giving them fewer opportunities to grow. Another way mindsets can impact pedagogical decisions is in the ways we group students. Um, and, and I'll describe some research here that Joe Bowler talks about in her work um, with the caveat that you, you would choose and use your professional judgment whether this is an appropriate topic to bring up with the people you're working with because we know some policies are in place that um, don't permit teachers to change whether or not this is happening in their classroom, but it's important to keep in mind and be aware that, uh, of the results in this, in this area. And what we see is that ability grouping um, or tracking, it, it really does seem to implicitly communicate to students um, that the teachers are um, holding a fixed mindset about students' intelligence and even potential. So some research from a group of British students that were in tracked math classes. We have some interesting quotes here we've pulled from that study. Um, and teacher, or students, um, they reported that their math classes felt like a psychological prison, prison that breaks students' ambitious, ambition because it almost formally labels kids as stupid. So um, I think this is really important to keep in mind. Even with the young students were able to pick up on the ability grouping and it impacted their own self-perceptions as demonstrated from this quote from a kindergarten student who said, all the clever students have gone into a different class now. It's kind of heartbreaking to hear. And what we know on the opposite end of the spectrum is that when students are instead uh, placed in heterogeneous classes, they achieve more, they achieve better, and they achieve higher than students that are ability grouped. So a group of American um, school districts that stopped using ability grouping in middle school math classes so that all students, regardless of past performance, took more rigorous math classes, had some really exciting results. They found that more students took advanced math classes once they got to high school, and more students actually passed those classes. Um, what's more, when it came to standardized state test scores, the students even earned higher scores and they saw a dramatic narrowing of their achievement gap between white and minority students. And these results were consistent whether students came into middle school with high or low math achievement. So as opposed to being <clears throat> something that kept students in their, um, their level, so to speak, this seemed to bring everyone up to um, a higher level together. Now, in addition to influencing teachers' pedagogical decisions, there's an interesting body of research that shows teachers' own mindsets impact how they communicate to students and the kinds of feedback that they give. 
So for instance, teachers that hold more of a fixed mindset um, uh, tend to react to students that are struggling in different ways and providing those students with more comfort instead of providing them with different strategies and ways to grow. So when I say comfort, it's um, like this quote you see here that um, something like, oh, you know, plenty of people have trouble in math, but you know what, there's a good chance you could go on to be very successful in other fields. And what's the problem here is that even though that might feel like a kindness and it might be comforting to, comforting to a student, when students hear that feedback, they actually are interpreting this, that the teacher had lower expectations for them, um, and then they themselves had lower motivation and lower expectations for their own success in math. Another way teachers' mindsets can impact students is the kinds of um, feedback they give to students and the kinds of praise they offer. We know that we have some important research that we review several times in this presentation um, on the kinds of ways we praise students um, and whether we're praising students' intelligence as opposed to their effort. So you might also heard of this referred to as um, person praise versus process praise. And research has shown that when um, praising students' intelligence or their ability has a host of negative consequences. And first and foremost, it makes them more focused on their performance on proving that they have this innate talent and they want to continue to prove it to you, as opposed to focusing on learning and improving. These students, when they're praised for intelligence, also tend to demonstrate less task persistence. They also rate that they enjoy the task less and had lower performance after experiencing a setback. And this is compared to children who were instead praised for their process or their effort. Uh, we also know that this kind of process linked to ability or um, uh, intelligence also seems to in encourage students to adopt more of a fixed mindset as opposed to a growth mindset. Now there's been a, a lot of focus in, um, in getting the message about growth mindset out about how very important it is to, uh, for teachers to reflect on the kinds of messages they send to students. Um, and instead of praising students, good job, you did really well, to instead focus on their process and their effort. Um, but I think it's really important to spend some time uh, reflecting on the fact that growth mindset isn't just about trying harder. This isn't just about putting forth more effort. Um, because some students might hear you say, I did, I mean, if you tell a student you just need to try harder, harder, it's possible that students can say, well, I did try hard, but I still don't get it. I must not just be cut out for this. Um, and what's more, uh, this, this slide is getting at that same idea that it's really imperative that growth mindset isn't just boiled down to telling students to work hard. And this has some equity implications that I would, I, it's really important to spend some time um, thinking about and talking about. And because we know that um, some students, particularly students from traditionally marginalized communities, um, there's not enough hard work in the world for them to be able to overcome the systemic aspects of their experience due to their race, due to their gender, and due to their economic situations that um, are systematically oppressing them. So this is a problem because when we tell students, just try harder, we're placing the burden of effort only on their shoulders. Um, it's about their effort, and if they still fail, then it's just a matter of they, them not trying hard enough. Um, when, of course, there are, as the adults in the situation, it's very much our job to um, help them uh, overcome and combat those systemic aspects of their experience that are also um, impacting them. The other problem with oversimplifying growth mindset to being just about working harder is that when we praise students for effort, um, when students aren't learning, it sends the message that learning isn't the end objective, effort is. So kind of the A for effort mindset, when very much the, the heart of growth mindset and the, the key idea here is that we want students to be um, learning, that we want to see this growth and effort in the service of learning is great, but if effort isn't leading to learning, then that means some more strategies are needed. 
So instead of just boiling growth mindset down to the need to work harder, it's really important to keep the focus on effort in the service of learning and encouraging students to not only put forth more effort, but also to seek out and try new strategies. And it's our job as adults to make sure that we're providing opportunities for them to um, get linked to those new strategies and providing assistance from ourselves and their peers when they're stuck. And we take this kind of track. Students are, um, are getting more information and we're talking about, yes, I appreciate your, your effort to this point. Um, you seem to be struggling still to meet that goal, so let's talk about what you can try next. Uh, discussion of mindsets and equity also, I think it's really important to tie in here um, the role of math stereotypes and how they can, uh, how they are linked to mindsets. When teachers or students um, endorse stereotypes about math, and math ability, that some people have it, some people don't, and we know who those people tend to be, we're endorsing a math uh, fixed mindset about math, that some people are just more naturally talented and some aren't. And this is a problem um, for a host of reasons, and, I, and a really ro robust body of research shows us that stereotypes um, not only constrict children's aspirations, but also really shape their academic identity and the kinds of goals they set for themselves. And one stereotype, of course, that's really relevant whenever we talk about math is the stereotype that women are not as good as men and boys at math. And what's really unfortunate about stereotypes is that children become aware of these stereotypes really young. Some evidence suggests as early as second grade. And children can endorse stereotypes, and this ha tends to happen around grade seven. For instance, research shows if you ask a child, give them a blank piece of paper, and instruct them to draw a scientist, the majority of students, boys and girls, of any race or ethnicity, tend to draw a white male. So what this points to is the stereotypes we have about which gender is supposed to be good at math and which race ethnicity is supposed to be good at math. Stereotypes can really have a huge impact, and gender stereotypes about math are likely to play a big role in the gender disparities that persist in math and other math-intensive fields like science and engineering. We really care about how students feel about themselves and think about their abilities, and this quote from Shelley Carell um, is really indicative of why we care. And she writes that boys do not pursue mathematical activities at a higher rate than girls do because they are better at math. They do so at least partially because they think they are better. And what this points to is how very important our own self-conceptions are about the paths we take and the things we're interested in. Stereotypes that associate math and also science, technology, engineering, the STEM fields, with boys and men act as barriers. And what happens here is they prevent girls from developing interest in STEM at a very young age. And this stereotype is twofold. First, there's the cultural stereotype that STEM, math, is something that has, uh, is, is, is associated with males. This is something that men and boys do. But the double whammy here is that there's also this ability stereotype, that girls have less ability than boys when it comes to math. So these two things in conjunction seem to be really driving the persistent gender gaps we see in our society in STEM participation. This can be depressing as we know how persistent these these gender gaps are, but the good news is that we know that we can counteract these stereotypes, and when we do so, we can increase girls' interest in STEM by not only increasing their confidence that these are skills they can develop, but also by helping them feel like they belong in these fields. The good news is that fostering a growth mindset can really help change students the way they engage with STEM fields. For instance, research shows that having a growth mindset influence both the motivation and the aspirations of clinicians in organic chemistry. We also know that growth mindset positively impacts minority students who are confronting stereotypes about their race and their perceived intelligence of their race. This is a place in a training with teachers that I would want to give a nice long pause to help people reflect and think about how stereotypes might be playing a role in their classroom. This is one question you might use to engage teachers in a training to get them to think about that, and that's what evidence have you seen in classrooms and schools that there are stereotypes about who is and who isn't good at math. Next in your facilitator's guide, you'll see that we've built in an activity to help culminate the section of learning about the research on growth mindset to help teachers get more engaged with the material themselves. <clears throat> and this activity is what we call a jigsaw activity. It's something that might be familiar to you in your work. Uh, it is a method of classroom organization that was originally developed to help foster relationships 
Um, and it does so by forcing group members to depend on one another and interact to complete a lesson successfully. And so we're applying it here to increase um, uh, collaboration in a training, but also to help people um, learn about and engage with research on growth mindset in, in, in a deeper way. So what happens in the jigsaw method, here's an example of how you might use it in a classroom setting, is students are divided into expert groups. And each expert group learns extensively about one component of a lesson. So for instance, if you were teaching students about central tendency, you might divide students, one group of students learns how to calculate and the definition of the mean, another learns about the mode, and a final group learns about the median. After uh, students have a chance to really know their own content of their expert area, then you regroup them into their sharing groups. And each of these sharing groups includes just a single expert on each of the different components of the lesson. Then each of the experts are required to teach their group members about their expert topic and share with the rest of the group. So in this way, in order for the group to understand all the components of the lesson, they have to depend on one another. So we have an activity built into this uh, training where you would do such an activity with some readings on growth mindset research. These are studies that we have already referenced in the training, but we've prepared some handouts that are a condensed version of these research articles. In the expert groups, you would group folks so that they would get a chance to read about one article in particular. So after teachers are grouped for one particular study that they're interested in learning more about, they read it, the study summary independently and then discuss with their other expert group members, um, discuss that study and, and write some notes, for instance, on a piece of poster paper. How would you describe this research and its implications? Um, also directing them to think about how is this relevant to you and your role? And then in the next phase of this activity, you would mix it up, have those expert groups now um, reorganized into sharing groups so that there are new groups at each of the posters and each study is represented within each group. They then teach each other about the content of the study they're an expert on. So within those sharing groups, you'd have one volunteer from each of the expert group spend about two minutes summarizing what they learned about the study that they read and discussed and sharing with their colleagues how that might be applied in their research. And we like this as an activity, um, not only to make this training a little bit more engaging and interactive, but also give people a chance to really dig into the research a little bit more in depth. At this point in the training, we would take a well-deserved break. You've been talking a lot, your um, participants have been listening a lot. We would give them at least five to 10 minutes to take a break uh, and, and refresh themselves before launching into the next section of the training where we talk about the classroom strategies and interventions to promote growth mindset. All right, next up, we're going to discuss some classroom strategies to promote growth mindset. And I'm gonna turn the mic over now to my colleague, Shannon Davidson, to kick things off. Thank you, Karen, for walking us through the research review. And we are excited now to transition into some strategies. And you may find that in this section, you hear some ideas that are confirming things that you or the teachers you work with are already doing, and that's great. Uh, hopefully, you'll get some new ideas as well. Uh, the strategies that we discuss in the next sections fall into three basic categories. First, we'll talk about how to create a positive classroom climate for learning and particularly for learning math. Then we'll talk about how to give feedback that promotes effort in learning. And finally, teach students about how learning happens in the brain. First, we'll talk about how to create a positive classroom climate for learning and for math. In a classroom that has a positive climate, Everyone feels like they are capable of learning. Mistakes are turned into learning experiences. Students feel that they have help available when needed. And importantly, they feel that teachers are expecting effort from them. This leads to positive student academic mindsets because failure or mistakes become part of the learning process. And students understand that with practice, they grow smarter and their efforts pay off. One of the strategies found to be effective is setting the norm that it's okay to make mistakes. This includes creating an environment in which students openly share their mistakes so that everyone can learn from them. And teachers can explain that mistakes are important because they provide opportunities to learn. Teachers can also make sure they're assigning work that encourages mistakes because it challenges students. So it's important to emphasize here that 
making mistakes shouldn't just be presented as something that's okay. It should actually be encouraged and expected as a necessary part of learning. Other researchers have emphasized that classrooms and labs for STEM should be as welcoming as possible with neutral items like plants and wall art instead of stereotypic items like Star Trek posters. Teachers can also use social media, posters, and assignments to show the diversity of people working in STEM. The key here is to show that STEM practitioners themselves are diverse, and this is normal, not exceptional. So teach about and celebrate diverse role models in STEM. At this point during your training, you may wish to pause and have a discussion with teachers about some other ways that teachers can create a positive climate in the math classroom, other than the ways that we've just discussed. And now I will hand things over to Lauren, who's going to talk about some ways that we can give feedback to promote effort and learning. All right, thank you, Shannon. Um, so Karen mentioned earlier that there's research about feedback and the praise that teachers give um, good students that can affect their mindset. So we're going to go into a little more detail on that and also touch on some activities um, for that. So one of the uh, big ideas here is that teachers should be giving formative feedback um, rather than grades. Um, as much as possible. I know that there's going to be limits to what is appropriate in any given school or district um, with what is required of teachers. Um, but some research, such as a study by Butler, found that when um, students were either given a grade um, with no feedback, given a grade and feedback, or just given that formative constructive feedback, um, the only students that really learned anything uh, were the students in the third group that were only given feedback. It turns out that when students are given a grade, that's what they tend to pay attention to. So if you want to encourage students to learn, um, maybe shying away from giving letter or number grades um, is a good strategy for uh, teachers to try. So Karen mentioned earlier that there's a difference between person praise versus process praise, um, and touched on the idea that um, you promote a fixed mindset and the praise recipient when you praise their, um, them as a person or their intelligence, such as saying, you must be smart at these problems when they do well. Um, in contrast, if you praise the person's process or the effort they went through, you tend to promote a growth mindset on the part of that person that you're praising, such as saying, you must have worked really hard at these problems. So here are some additional examples that you can show um, to the teachers you are working with. And one I really like to call attention to is in the process effort column, the very bottom one. Um, something that's really especially challenging is to give uh, constructive feedback to students who are struggling with something. It's much easier um, to stay focused on what's constructive and appraising process when a student is succeeding. Um, so this is a, something that might actually trick some, a trip some teachers up when you're working with them um, to ask them to consider how um, they should give praise for process and effort even when a student is struggling. And this activity can help you work on that. So here's an activity you could do with teachers. Um, it would require you to do a little bit of legwork in advance and that you would need to uh, provide examples of praise, both fixed mindset and growth mindset praise. And you could even throw in some curveballs if you'd like um, on post-it notes. And then have t groups of teachers look at each of those examples, determine whether or not they think it is uh, an example of praise that would promote a growth mindset or a fixed mindset. And if they think it's something that would promote a fixed mindset, the group can revise um, that example praise to really try to come up with something better. Um, so these are just a couple of examples here. Here's another one. You finish so quickly. You are such a good student. So the teacher group could consider this, and then maybe they revise it to something like this. I can tell you're ready for something more challenging, in part because of what we covered earlier, that if students aren't making mistakes, it could be that um, they are just already ready to move on from that work. They've mastered it already. Another example, I love your painting. It's really pretty. A group might look at that and decide, oh, I can tell you've been working hard to improve your painting skills. Tell me how you created this. After you've done this activity where teachers consider the different examples of praise, um, some time for discussion uh, would be appropriate, and you can ask them these questions. What's hard about giving process praise, for one? And what can help you remember to give process praise? 
And these are useful questions in part because many of us, when we went through school ourselves, we were not given process praise. We were given a lot of much more fixed mindset praise, at least I know that was definitely my experience. And when we were visiting teachers around the state, um, giving these uh, the session, we definitely heard that from the folks that we were working with, that they were really much more familiar with the sort of growth or fixed mindset promoting praise. All right, we've come to our last strategy to help promote a growth mindset, and that is teaching explicitly about how learning happens in the brain. So not everyone necessarily knows, especially not children, that um, our brains change as we learn. Um, they grow all kinds of neurons and networks between neurons in our brains. Um, and when people have learned a lot or have a lot of experiences, they simply have denser networks of neurons up in their brains. Um, in fact, uh, some prominent researchers, Blackwell and Yeager, have found that most people just don't realize that when they practice and learn things, that their brains change and get larger, a lot like muscles do. And this is true even for adults. Um, so this is a powerful quote you can share with the teachers you're working with. And you can also encourage them to go to MindsetWorks.com, which has some additional free resources um, that they can download. So Yeager and Blackwell and several other colleague colleagues have actually tried classroom interventions wherein they taught students explicitly that their brains change like muscles um, with challenge and effort, um, and that that is an important part of the growth process. Another way of describing this in a way that would be very clear to students um, is that learning or changing. Another useful way of describing this in a way that children can relate to um, is to compare the abilities of an adult or an older child to a baby. Children are very aware, especially uh, many of them in the elementary years that might have uh, siblings, younger siblings, or they might have friends that have younger siblings. And they're very aware that, that uh, babies come to the world not having a lot of abilities and not being able to speak, not being able to walk. But over time, they learn more, they start walking and talking, and that this is a process that takes effort. Um, this is another really great analogy of how uh, change takes effort um, and practice. So the activity um, that we have for you um, involves students reading an article that is written at the third grade reading level called You Can Grow Your Intelligence. And this article is included in your packet of resources um, that Karen emailed out. Um, after they read it, they uh, reflect on something that they couldn't do very well at one point in their lives, but then they practice and they got better at it. And this doesn't have to be an academic example. It could be when they were learning how to play football and at first they couldn't kick the ball straight to get it to the goal post. Or they um, were, when they were learning how to swim and at first they were very afraid of the water, but eventually got to where they could do it. When students reflected on this, they write a letter of encouragement. It can just be a few sentences long. Definitely make this appropriate for the age of students you're working with. Um, to an imaginary future student who is struggling at school and maybe might be feeling dumb because they're having a hard time. So this, this process um, is known as uh, saying is believing, um, and it's a pretty well-researched uh, strategy for getting students to really think deeply about something um, and then apply it to being to another person. Oh, I don't like how that came out. This strategy of having students learn and read something, reflect on it, and then try to help someone else out um, is called saying is believing. Um, and it's well researched and we'll touch on it in other sessions in this series. And the, the key idea is that they're not only getting time to reflect and sort of apply what they're doing, they're also being of service and helping someone else out instead of being thought of as um, someone who's struggling and needs help themselves. In your packet, um, oh, I should go back. I didn't mention at any point that there's also the teacher's guide. Ugh. So in addition to the article, You Can Grow Your Intelligence, that um, would, is for the students, there is also a teacher guide um, that you could print out and give with the article to teachers. It walks them step by step, step by step how to enact um, this activity with their students. So what do you think? This is a question you could ask uh, two teachers um, after you've introduced this activity to them, and they could reflect on it. Do they think they could incorporate it into their activity? And 
crucially, what they could change to make it work for their setting. Because we don't necessarily assume that uh, an activity is going to work right out of the box in any setting. And so it's important for teachers to realize they have the freedom to change it to make sure that it makes sense in their own classroom. All right, and now I'm going to hand this back to Karen to wrap it up. Thanks, Lauren, and thanks also to you, Shannon, for sharing about these interventions and strategies. At this point, um, I want to just recap where we are. We have walked you through the PowerPoint slide that you will be able to use with the accompanying facilitator's guide, and this starts with a review of the research and then all of the activities we just discussed. In your packet of materials, you have um, the slide deck, the facilitator guide, and then all of the handouts we've referenced within our presentation. If I were doing this training with a set of teachers, I would spend a good chunk of time at the end with an opportunity for reflection. Um, and here's a couple of questions you might consider. First, something along the lines of what stood out for you and increased your knowledge or changed your thinking during this session. We assume that the teachers you're working with may not have as much experience with the concept of growth mindset or the kinds of classroom strategies and teaching practices that would promote growth mindset. So it's good to give some space here for um, getting people to reflect on how they might change their practice after they leave your training. And finally, giving people some chance to also give some feedback on any points of the training that they're still struggling with. So asking what's something you're still struggling with or have questions about. Um, because growth mindset, I think, is a really weighty topic that can, um, it seems easy on first pass, a, a pretty easy concept, just it's about effort, not ability. But the more you dig into it, the more, I think, nuanced it is about how to implement this well and do it in such a way that really supports students. So giving your teachers, when you do a training like this, some time to ask questions. If I were working with a, uh, a less expert group of teachers, someone, or maybe even a group of families, someone outside education context that has never heard about growth mindset before, I might include an additional activity to really draw out the self-reflection. And so at the end of the slides here, we have included uh, a bonus activity. And this is walking people through the mindset quiz that is meant to help people. They, they, they complete this quiz, score their responses so that they can get a sense of kind of where they fall on the mindset scale of having a growth mindset versus a fixed mindset. So in this activity, after having people complete their, the quiz and score their responses, you'd have them partner up and talk about their score. Um, and then also think about their score as it relates to their experiences as a math student. I think this can be a really helpful activity when you're first introducing the concept of mindsets and, and getting people to think deeply about the way they feel about their abilities. So we are here at RHEL Northwest, and if you are interested in learning more about the work we do, please visit our website. Here's a brief overview of the kinds of work we do, but we definitely want to stay in touch um, and hear about your experiences. So here is some contact information. That about sums it up for us. We are looking forward to joining you again soon to talk about the other math attitudes of self-efficacy, math anxiety, and sense of belonging. If you have any questions in the meantime, please don't hesitate to reach out. We're excited to hear about how these trainings work for you and any questions you might encounter in your process. Um, thanks for joining us today, and we hope everyone has